No one cares about what's in your heart. I'm Simon Rafe, and I'm taking the hard line. Welcome back to Hardline, the show where we deal in unpleasant truths. The important part is the truth. Unpleasant is an unfortunate byproduct. I'm your host, Simon Rafe. I'll be chatting later with my producer, Joe Enders, a man banned from more social media platforms than Donald Trump. And towards the end of the show, we'll be joined by, joined by Jules Gomesh, our Rome correspondent, for a gentleman's chat. But for now, no one cares about what's in your heart. Like, literally no one, except perhaps you and possibly a bunch of Karens who want to use it as leverage. And both of you are wrong. First off, what is literally in your heart? A half pint of blood, and if you're eating too much of the wrong food, some plaque. And if you made what is now agreed to have been a poor decision, some myocarditis. Obviously, we're not talking literally about the contents of your heart, nor are we really talking about your literal heart, that fist-sized, four-chambered thing pulsing in your chest. No, we're talking metaphorically, the heart as seat of emotion, of compassion, your innermost being, your true self. So what do we mean when we talk about what's in our heart? We most often contrast it with something external, something other, something we do or say. It doesn't matter, we say, it's what is in your heart that counts. The heart is the seat of our true self, our true intentions and meaning, and even being. That is what we should be judged on, weighed by. That is the thing that should be considered when people judge us, not actions we do or words we say or ways we appear. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish, poppycock, malarkey, balderdash, and dare I say it, ninny twist. I made that last word up, but you know exactly what it means. I'm like William Shakespeare or Roald Dahl. I'm just coining new words like the Federal Reserve printing money. It's rubbish. What is in your heart doesn't matter an iota, jot, tittle, or dare I say it, modicum. That is, in fact, a word. You know what it means. What is in your heart doesn't matter at all if it doesn't match what you are doing, saying, and being. First off, who knows what's in your heart? There are three people who know, Father, Son, Spirit. Only God can see into your heart. No one else. Human, angel, demon, animals, plants, the silicon animus AIs taking over the world. I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords. No one else can see what is in your heart. Not even you can, really. How honest are we with ourselves? Can we really take out our conscience and hold it in our hands and examine it critically and honestly? Can we be objective and dispassionate with it? Or do we make allowances that are unjustified? Give the benefit of the doubt when there isn't any. Do we judge ourselves by our best intentions while we judge others by their actions? Because of course, that's the point. No one can see what is in your heart, unless we're talking literally and it's some kind of axe murderer cracking your sternum and slicing open ventricles. But metaphorically, no one can see what is in your heart, what your intentions are, what your true feelings are, what your innermost thoughts are. No one can see that except by listening to what you say and watching what you do and judging how you appear. We have to judge others and others have to judge us by our actions. We have no other way of doing it. How many times have we heard some young man bemoan that his crush, the woman he adores from afar, the woman he desperately wants to be his girlfriend or wife or go on a date with him or maybe even just notice him. How many times have we heard him say, if only, if only she knew what I was like on the inside. If only she knew what was in my heart. How is she supposed to know except by what you do and say? If she had a little drone that followed you around 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, would she see what was in your heart? Or rather, what you say is in your heart. Because if it was in your heart, surely it would reflect in your words and actions and how you appeared. You will know them by their fruits. That's not me saying that. That's a quote from someone I'm sure you've heard of. He's kind of a big deal in Catholicism. He didn't write anything down, and most of what he said hasn't been recorded. But he left us some doozies of teaching. And this one is really important. You will know them by their fruits. It's 100% just a different way of saying what is in your heart doesn't matter if it doesn't match your actions. Now, certainly, is it possible to harbor hatred and malice but behave in a loving and charitable way? A genuinely loving and charitable way, I mean. Not some tricky, cunning deception designed to fool people so you can get close enough to hurt them or whatever. But is it possible to have hatred in your heart for someone, but tr still treat them in a loving, compassionate, genuine way? Helping them, praying for them, encouraging them, staying quiet when you can't say anything nice? 
Sure, it's very possible. And that hatred will go from your heart quicker than you can think because it just will. Or you will stop being kind and generous and start being cruel and tricksy and deceiving. Sooner or later, the truth will out or the truth will in to your heart. What about the reverse? You have love for someone, but you treat them horribly. You act like you hate them. You are cruel and vicious, but you love them, apparently. Do you really love them? Do you really love God if you don't keep his commandments? Do you love God if you don't go to Mass? Do you respect God if you don't make any kind of effort to dress smartly for Mass? Yep, we're going back there, but we won't stay there. It's just a single data point. Maybe we should stay there, at least as an example. See, the phrase, it's what in your heart that matters, is invariably uttered when someone is called out for their words or actions or behavior. God isn't concerned with how I dress. He's more concerned with what's in my heart. Well, yes, I specifically addressed that point. And a bunch of you, the audience, argued, it's what's in my heart that matters. The moment you say it's what's in my heart, you have tacitly admitted the thing being discussed is a problem. The failing, in this case, not dressing nicely, isn't dismissed because it's actually unimportant. It's dismissed because apparently God will judge us on something which only he can see, but which, and this is most important, judge us on something that we don't allow to impact our behavior. God will give us a pass because our intentions are apparently more important than what we do. I am personally opposed to abortion, but is literally, it's what in my heart that matters. Tell that to the millions of babies whose little hearts were stopped. We know what's in their hearts, caustic solutions and neurotoxins. Let's try another example, one that might drive it home. It doesn't matter how I receive the Eucharist, standing in the hands, whatever. It doesn't matter what my posture is. It doesn't matter if I eat it like it's a cookie or a nacho chip. It's what's in my heart that matters. Yes, what is in your heart matters, but what is in your heart if you don't let it influence your actions? Well, in my heart, I was supporting a pro-life position when I voted to expand abortion access. Well, in my heart, I was faithful to you when I cheated on you with some floozy in a Las Vegas motel. Well, in my heart, I was faithful to Christ when I stayed silent when he was blasphemed by my co-workers. What is truly in your heart if you don't let it impact your actions? Is the thing itself in there? The virtue, the philosophy, the love? Are those things in there if they don't show outward? By their fruits, you will know them. Well, their fruits are not particularly wholesome. At best, they are withered and dry and good for nothing. At worst, they are poisonous. What is in your heart doesn't matter if it never makes out of there. How can your actions evangelize if they aren't ever seen, if they never even exist? How can your words comfort and lead and help if they are never heard or are never even spoken? The road to hell is paved with good intentions because keeping your faith in your heart will lead you there. Your heart is full of good intentions and if they don't blossom into the fruit of good deeds, good words, good actions, they will do nothing good for you and actually do evil and worse. Because it tricks you into thinking you're doing all right, even though you aren't doing anything. It tricks you into thinking you're where you need to be, that you're going in the right direction, even when by all appearances you are going totally 180 degrees from where you should be. Enough of what's it's in my heart that matters. Don't believe it, stop saying it, and don't let people get away with it. By their fruits, you will know them. Plant it in your heart, yes, but fertilize it with courage so that it blossoms outside. All right, Joe, what do you think? Yeah, I think what you're mainly commenting on throughout this entire segment is, uh, is, uh, is, the, uh, is James, where he says, faith without works is dead. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think to be honest, I mean, there's... You and I were discussing this while we were producing the show a little, and you kept kind of pulling these examples from Scripture out, and they weren't ones that I'd initially thought of. Uh, so yes, it is. It's, it's faith without works is dead. It's by their fruits you will know them. It is also that wonderful piece in the Gospels from Jesus where he says there were, there were two sons, and one said he would do the will of the Father but didn't, and one said he wouldn't do the will of the Father but then did. Uh, and so, you know, these are... Uh, you know, the scripture is replete with this very important idea that it's not our intentions, it's our actions that are important. Yeah, and, 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 and even, even deeper than that, it's, it's crucial to, to your spiritual life that you recognize when you're not doing enough. You know, you need to know that you need to be conscious of these things where you just realize, I just sat silently. You know, cowardice is, is sinful. 
I mean, yeah. this is something that a lot of people need to understand and realize. When you step down from people that are blaspheming Christ at work, when you step down from, uh, from receiving the Eucharist reverently, when you step down from having a discussion about abortion, all of these things, and while, while thinking in your heart that it's, if you, if you do think in your heart that it's wrong, and you aren't saying anything, and you are backing down, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. That's cowardice. That is a sin. Yeah, Brad is uh, often, he will often talk, I uh, remember frequently on the download, which is coming back soon, by the way. We're going to have the download back. Uh, Brad would often talk on the download about sins of omission. Uh, and he was uh, a big proponent of people being aware of the evils and dangers of that. Uh, and that is, that is really kind of this important thing with the, it's what's in my heart that happens. It's, it's, it's rare that, that a Christian will actually use something like explicitly anti-Christian, something actively anti-Christian. Uh, but it's very often that, that, that a Christian will sit there silently Silently and say, well, it's what in my it's what's in my heart that matters, uh, and and these kind of things. Although, having said that, you know, we we do have this this whole ridiculousness of uh, like the personally opposed but uh, abortion crowd, and that's not just politicians. I know that there are you know some Christians out there who say, well, you know, I voted for this guy or I supported this guy because on balance I considered that there was something of equal importance to abortion. It's kind of like. I'm not really feeling that one, you know, and, and I don't see that it's what's in my heart that is going to actually uh, cover that. Well, this is some of the things that uh, one, of, one of the people that we've had on before, he, was, he, he really talks about, you know, Marx, Marxism infiltrating. Trevor Loudon, I, I don't know if you remember. Mm -hmm. But one of, one of the main points in a documentary that, uh, that, that I watched with him, and I cannot for the life of me remember the name. I apologize, Trevor. But, um, but besides that point, he, he talked about this thing called... But you remember I, in your heart, Joe. I That's remember the important it in my heart. Yeah, you remember exactly. it in your heart. I, I'm not bagging down. <laughs> if I remembered it, I would say the name of it right now. Um, but uh, but uh, he talked about pie pietism in the United States. There was this, this, yes, it was this, it was this movement where, where people were trying to say, well, religion shouldn't really be involved in politics. We should focus internally. We shouldn't focus on the outside world and do any other things like that. And that is exactly what you're talking about. And that's exactly what's been infecting the, Amer you know, the churches in America for probably about 150 years now. Yeah. So it's interesting to see it come to fruition. And it's also interesting to see how scripture explicitly denounces ideas like pietism. Yeah. You know, I think as, as well, you know, we can quote uh, Edmund Burke, you know, the, the, the triumph of evil. It's only necessary that good men do nothing. Uh, and that's kind of what we, what we see right now uh, with, uh, for example, all of these social ills that are advancing the world, you know, homosexualism, uh, transgenderism, all of this kind of stuff is advancing contraception, yada, yada, yada. All of these grave evils are advancing. Well, really, if people just stood there and said no, if there were enough people to, for example, go to the school boards and protest and get elected to the school boards and actually stand for these issues and so forth, things would turn around. And that's not just me saying it. We've seen that happen in certain places where small groups of people have got together and done this. Uh, really, in many ways, this is kind of the, the entire foundation of our resistance initiative that we have here, that Alex runs here. It's this idea that, okay, you've got this stuff in your heart, wonderful. How do you get it out there to actually make a change? How do you fight, fight against that, that pietism? I, I love that. That's, that's a great word. That is absolutely superb. Anyway, I think that's about all we've got time for, Joe. Always uh, a pleasure to talk to you, and I will see you next week. Everyone should remember to check out Joe's show, Red Top Report, which is on a, a, a number of times each week. Every single time I turn around, it seems there's a new episode and Joe is being uh, based and red-pilled, uh, as I believe the, uh, the youth discuss it today. Uh, a wonderful show to watch, always enjoyable. Anyway, now from one gentleman to another, we'll be shifting over to our explicit gentleman's chat with our favorite Rome correspondent, our favorite Anglo-Indian, our favorite former Anglican. His CV is just long as long as an FBI file on a traditionalist Catholic. Jules Gomesh, our Rome correspondent for our gentleman's chat. So, Jules, what is happening over there in the old world, as they say? The old world continues to be very exciting. I've got some stonking news from Scotland. Scotland, and, wow. Uh, well, yeah. well, you know, Simon, uh, the best news, I think the only good news of 2023 is Nicola Sturgeon's exit as First Minister of Scotland. And she got her knickers in a real twist there because they asked her about trans 
people in prisons, mm -hmm. biological males who pretend they are women and get into women's prisons and rape other women there. And that actually happened. And, you know, Sturgeon was tongue-tied and uh, went yammering about it, and she was out. Yeah. But the great news is that uh, Kate Forbes, who is a 32-year wonderful Cambridge graduate in history. Her parents were missionaries to India. She's got some great heroes of the faith, like Eric Little, that great runner in the 1924 Paris Olympics, who refused to run because it was held on a Sunday. And uh, uh, she's standing, but my goodness, the flack she's getting from the liberals is astonishing. Yeah, so I, I suppose if she's getting all of the, the hatred from the right people, or the wrong people, I suppose, depending on which, which, side of, uh, which side of the issue you're on, but she's getting all the hatred from the right people, uh, is that because she's got uh, particularly strong stances on many of the things we as Catholics will be concerned about? Absolutely. She belongs, she belongs to the Free Church of Scotland, which is a conservative evangelical denomination, solid on the Bible. I am I am very, very well aware of the Free Church positions. of Scotland. Yes, my, my parents used to live in Scotland for a while, and uh, it was in a little enclave that was much uh, controlled by the Free Church of Scotland. And, and yes, things were not open on Sundays, and the whole, the whole thing it was a very Absolutely. Christian little enclave. So, sorry, carry on. Absolutely. So, she's Free Church. So, uh, you know, she's got all the right... Christian, biblical, orthodox positions on homosexuality. She's openly said uh, she does not, you know, she's not happy with people having children outside marriage because marriage is the only place for sexual relationships. And then she's uh, <laughs> very openly said in an interview that trans women are actually biological males identifying as women. Oh my goodness, that was a nuclear bomb. Wow. But Simon, very interesting from you know our perspective, what's going on in the Catholic Church. She's drawn the line on women's ordination. And what the media have done to target her is that they've gone back to a letter she published in a blog in 2014 when the Church of Scotland, the Liberal Church of Scotland, you know, began, you know, ordaining women and all this sort of thing. I think they did it much before that, but they took us, they attacked people who were holding to the traditionalist perspective. And she marshaled superb arguments against mm. the ordination of women, even using 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, I, where Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach over a man. Now, um, uh, thankfully, the Catholic bishop spokesperson, Peter Kearney, has come to a rescue and said that Catholics will support her because if we don't support her tomorrow, a Catholic will not, a faithful Catholic will not be able to stand for election because they're going to hammer him on the same test mm -hmm. you, you know, You are against abortion, you can't enter Parliament. And uh, uh, lo and behold, following that, the Muslims have promised to support her. And they have said, we believe in binary, you know, we believe in a binary gender, male and female only. We believe uh, in modesty, sex within marriage. We do not permit uh, homosexuality. And ironically, and this is irony, there is a Muslim who is standing against uh, uh, Forbes. But they're saying, we're not going to support our own candidate. We're going to support Kate Forbes because <laughs> our candidate, Hamza Yusuf, is a leftist and he's pro-gay marriage, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And now the Hindus have also come out in favor of her. Wow. So that's very exciting. And I think we really need to pray for Kate Forbes. Well, this is, this is, this is amazing, Jules. This, this, this. This is the kind of ecumenism we need. Not, you know, like some dumb, ugly building or three of them in, you know, the Middle East that we call like some ecumenical center or whatever it is. This, this kind of ecumenism <laughs> is what we need. You know, oh no, that, that's, that's absolutely superb. Obviously, surely, you know, surely, surely, obviously we, we should definitely be praying for her. Yeah. Family house. That's, that's marvelous. Yeah, that's isn't that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, excellent, Jules. You got some good news. Uh, but you you mentioned uh, when we were just 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 chatting earlier this week. You mentioned uh, this kind of news out of Liverpool. What's what's happening in Liverpool? Well, you know, Liverpool used to be my old stomping ground. I was canon theologian at 
the largest Anglican cathedral in the world. And five minutes down the road, I would often walk and go to what was affectionately called Paddy's Wigwam. Paddy's Wigwam, we've all seen it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, Paddy's Wigwam, because it was a kind of modernist monstrosity in terms of architecture. And uh, the cathedral had a very good uh, choral service, uh, both even song and or vespers, as the Catholics call it, and uh, commute, ho holy mass in the morning. It used to be extremely well attended. And I'm now seeing pictures of the morning mass, the main mass in Liverpool Cathedral. And it's shocked me to the core. Oh. Uh, I can bet you, walk five minutes down the road and you will see more people, young people, at the Anglican Cathedral in Liverpool than at the Catholic Cathedral. Now, this is remarkable and it's very tragic because Liverpool, as you know, Simon, he, because of Irish immigration and all that sort of thing, was a predominantly Catholic yes, yes. city. I mean, I used to walk down the road in my dog collar and people would say, good morning, Father. That, that was just common, and these were Catholics. And to see this sudden, you know, melt down in the diocese of Liverpool, and sources there tell me it's all over Liverpool, but instead of doing something to remedy the situation, they have just banned the Latin Mass at, I think it's St. John's Parish in Wigan. Now, these are poor parts of the country. And where is our compassion for poor, marginalized Catholics? I mean, both financially and in terms of their oppression, who want to go to the old right mass. Yeah. And then masses have been axed, you know, uh, a, a number of masses in the diocese of Leeds, I'm told by Bishop Marcus Stork there. And uh, Scotland, uh, they've been hit very badly in Scotland and um, a, a few Catholics there, I'm told by reliable sources, these Catholics are as mad as a box of frogs. That's the actual quote. I'm saying, well, we will no longer go to mass. Wow. Or, as my yeah. Boris has been warning us, we're just going to do our own thing and go independent. And, and listen to this, Simon. Uh, people on the blog, uh, this is Catholic Truth Scotland, uh, respond and say, but isn't that Protestant? And uh, 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 people then get back and say, oh, well, y y yes, yes, but the circumstances demand well, it. Well, so okay. yes, that's the yes state of emergency and what have you. I mean, obviously, I sympathize. Uh, with with those people uh, and they're in a terrible situation, but they're making the wrong choice there uh, Following on from this crackdown. We've heard this crackdown on the Latin mass has been repeated all across the world in many different dioceses many different uh, Parishes and so forth, but as well Jules that I think there's kind of a crackdown on sort of traditionalist communities of nuns as well Now this is a very big question. The question is why is the Vatican cracking down on cloistered orders in particular and when they do that like they did earlier this month on uh, the sisters uh, these are the benedictine sisters of mary temple of the holy spirit in pienza uh, in italy now interesting all of these orders if you notice have very nice pieces of real estate ah. uh, a month ago, I wrote another story, and this was a crackdown on the daughters of Santa Chiara on the Amalfi Coast. Ah, now, that property is worth quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, yes. uh, the, 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 the talk here is very clearly that, uh, you know, the Vatican wants these orders out, uh, and it will use... It's not really giving reasons. Uh, why this heavy-handed uh, sledgehammer approach to these orders? I mean, if, if they told us that, you know, there was sexual abuse there, for example, we would understand. But no reasons given at all, some vague reason, and we want you out. Yeah, well, and it just... The yeah. Sister, yeah, absolutely. And the sisters in Santa Clara actually gave a donation about, of about 50,000 euros, something other like that. No, no, it's just a very big amount to the Vatican, to the Pope's fund, in the hope that they would not close them down. But the Vatican took the money 
and shut them and down. Shut them. Well, you know, look, I mean, I think the argument is if they've got 50,000 euros, then they may have, you know, another 50,000 or 100,000 or half a million or something like that. Yeah, I think, I think we know what's going on there, Jules. That's, that's lucre, that's real estate, that's them wanting the money. Jules, we have run out of time. It is always good to talk to you. We'll see you next week. Jules, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Simon. It's always a pleasure. Always wonderful to speak with Jules there. Always has something good to say, even if nothing good is going on in Rome. And remember, it really doesn't matter what's in your heart if that doesn't make it outside into the world. You are supposed to be the salt of the earth. You are supposed to be the light of the world. What happens if you keep your salt in a box? What happens if you're keeping your light under a bushel or indeed in the dark chambers of your heart? Open your heart up. Let all of these wonderful Catholic and Christian virtues you have out into the world change the world. Do a good thing. I'm Simon Rafe, and I've taken the hard line.